Backstage with Millionaires almost died. I've never shared this story publicly before, but back in 2021, we faced our biggest adversary till date, and the weight of that challenge nearly crushed us. That challenge was Indian regulations. So Backstage with Millionaires is a brand under my company Towards Ventures Private Limited, which I co-own with my co-founder Prithvi. And this company is registered in the state of Karnataka, but before we registered it, we consulted with a couple of CAs because we wanted to know how we should proceed knowing that I'm a foreigner and there might be some additional regulations or compliances around that fact. And the advice that we got from each and every one of those CAs was that Prithvi should actually register the company under his name and the name of one of his family members first as a private limited, but not having me be involved from the get-go. And then later on, I would come in as a foreign investor, putting in my FDI, my foreign direct investment, and acquiring my co-founding stake in the company. They said that route was the easiest to go about it, and so that's what we did. And so I came in later on and tried to acquire 45% of the company, leaving Prithvi with the remaining 55% of the company, but things did not go as planned. And Maybe one of these days, if you guys want me to, I'll do a story time video where I share the entire nine month story in detail because yes, that's right. It took nine months for us to finally get approval from the MCA. It was a complete nightmare. There were so many things that I wish I had known before getting into this. I had no idea how complicated it would be to acquire stake in an Indian company, let alone run one because we're still running this business, right? There are still ongoing compliances that we have to be aware of. We have to keep up to date with. And if we don't, we can easily get in trouble. So running a business, whether you're a foreigner or not, is a very difficult thing to do, especially in India, unfortunately. The amount of ambiguity around legalities, compliances, and regulations can end up becoming a huge expense and also a huge distraction from the main point of starting up, which is to solve a problem for customers and to build that solution. So I wanna hear from you guys. There's a link in the description down below to a Google form where collecting information, questions, or experiences that you guys have had, even if you're an early stage startup founder, or if you're a seasoned entrepreneur at this point, or even if you're someone who's never started up before, but you do have questions around things like, for example, paying taxes, registering a company, navigating trademarks or labor laws, raising funds and ESOPs. I want to know everything. And this will all be strictly confidential. Of course, we're just going to hold on to it for ourselves. We won't be sharing it with anybody else. The reason why we want this information is that we're trying to find topics or ideas for content that could be helpful for people like me. I got caught off guard when I was faced with these regulatory compliances and we want to make content that can help other early stage startup founders avoid getting caught off guard the way that I was. And you don't need to subscribe to the channel. You don't need to like the video or leave a comment, nothing like that. The thing that we would really appreciate if you're enjoying our videos, if you're enjoying our content then going down into that link in the description and filling out, just giving a little bit of input on that Google form would really mean a lot to us. So thank you guys so much. And now let's jump into the startup news because B2B raw materials marketplace of business is in a bit of hot water because of allegations from former employees that it's extremely difficult to quit the company. Now, this story was cracked wide open by the morning context, so full credit to those guys for doing the research here. But before I dive into the allegations, I want to show you a clip from a podcast that the founder and CEO of Of Business, Ashish Mohapatra, did nine months ago. Check this out. We just hire freshers. And in freshers, we just look for two or three things. You won't believe it. We are a team of now about close to 1,400 people. Out of 1,400, only 50 people are in their second jobs or later. First job is off business. So what do I get there? I get a guy who is very malleable, who likes listening to me and wants to be like me or wants to listen to somebody who is like me. So that was from The Barbershop with Shantanu, and that's an amazing podcast, by the way, you should definitely check it out. But now that we've heard all that and we've gotten that context, let's go back to the morning context and read the first line of this article. People tend to abscond from of business. Now, why would they do that? Well, further down in the article, we find the answer. There are no exit processes as such in of business. If you want to leave, they'll just not let you. Now, these are not my words here. These are the words of an anonymous employee. So do take them with a grain of salt. There's no way for us to validate or verify that what these employees are saying, or even if these employees are real people at all, or if what they're saying is true. So keep that in mind. But a little bit further down, we get into a bit of what it's like to allegedly quit from a business. There have been cases where the entire notice period of 60 or 90 days passed and the resignation was not accepted. There are a lot of organizations that negotiate with you, tell you to 
to stay back. This is not that. There are threats here. The threat of the billionaire table is the most common. You know who we are, right? We have the ability to ruin your career. You won't find a job elsewhere. The threats are real. At times, conditions are attached to the resignations. If you can achieve this target, you can leave the next day. You land, say, an X worth of clients first, and then we can talk about the exit. These aren't there in the offer letter. Now, it wouldn't be fair, of course, not to share of businesses' perspective and input here. They have commented on this situation, and here's what they had to say. On exits, we have a well-outlined smooth process as shared in the trial. Exits could be on multiple counts, as in any organization. In case of performance, performance issues, we first invest in coaching, retraining, shifting across departments, and then may either put an employee on a performance improvement plan to show improvement in a given timeline, or there could be a mutual separation in case of fitment issues. They also said that the culture of the company is that of altruism, brotherhood, and camaraderie, and that there are no outstanding full and final payments. They are cleared when the employee exits. However, there are some things now that have come to the surface, screenshots of WhatsApp messages, emails, and even a long LinkedIn post written by a former employee, Rahul Saha. So he had quit working at Of Business and actually documented his experience online. He filed a complaint with the Labor Commissioner of Hyderabad, and here's what it said. Leadership didn't allow me to quit and stall the acceptance of my resignation. On top of this, Mr. Nitin Jain and Mr. Ashish Mohapatra threatened to destroy my career if I didn't stay back. Finally, after a lot of struggle, they approved. It has been almost a year since my resignation. My full and final settlement and experience letter is still pending, and the management is outright denying it. Now, again, these are not my words here. These are his words, but I also want to share some screenshots of conversations that he allegedly had with the individuals that he mentioned there. So I'll just put those on screen. You're welcome to pause the video if you want to read them. I won't go into detail here because it would take me quite a while to read through those conversations. But then also, here's Rahul's LinkedIn post that he made on the situation. Again, feel free to pause if you want to. He goes into detail about what happened. And the thing is that once Rahul posted this, more employees started coming out of the woodwork to share their experiences as well. So here's one of those employees exchanges over email. Again, feel free to pause if you want to. And then another employee alleged that they were expected to pay back losses that were incurred during their time at the company. Otherwise, they wouldn't get their full and final settlement. Then there is another screenshot, which is allegedly from a company group chat about adding positive glass door reviews. And this isn't an unusual thing. I think a lot of startups try to change glass door reviews or add positive glass door reviews, it's not that uncommon. And as an individual isolated thing, that wouldn't be a big deal. But all of this stuff coming together does paint a bit of a damning picture for of business. But here's what the company had to say about all of this. We take exits due to integrity issues very seriously, which could be related to fraudulent practices or mismanagement, which has resulted in severe commercial loss for the company or breach of the company's data security guidelines. Many of the unceremonious exits mentioned by Ashish in his mail result in either employees not serving notice, absconding, or joining the competition to cause further nuisance to the company, which we sometimes ignore in the best interest of the ecosystem. The quantum of any unceremonious exits, such episodes can be counted on fingertips and are not representative of either our culture or exit process. Such anecdotes could be exaggerated by certain ex-employees for their selfish gains or motivations and not representative of a company with 1,500 plus people, which has seen hundreds of seamless exits and full and final settlements. So I've shared both sides with you guys. You're welcome to form your own opinions and you can also find links to the more Morning Context article, the LinkedIn post from that former employee, as well as that podcast from the barbershop down in the description down below. But now let's move on to our next topic. Very exciting. I actually tweeted about this. The e-plane company has become the first Indian EV aircraft startup to get approval for commercial production from the DGCA. According to their website, these guys are building a flying electric taxi for 10x faster commute in your city. And I personally could really uh, use this service. I would love it if it actually was a thing here in Bengaluru. I'll put a little clip of my regular daily commute at the moment as it's raining quite a bit in Bengaluru. This just happened yesterday. So 
enjoy that while I continue to talk about this news item. Uh, scrolling a little bit further down on the page, we can see the specs for their flying taxi, which again, they've gotten approval to commercially produce this taxi. And it's apparently going to be about 200 kilometers in terms of the range, the distance that it can cover. It'll be a two seater vehicle, human piloted, not AI piloted or remotely piloted. And it's a little more than double the width of an average car. All right, next up, a couple of quick news items here. First of all, Uber is launching Uber Green in India. And my interpretation of this is that this is just them realizing that EV ride hailing startup Blue Smart is chipping away at their market share. And Uber, of course, doesn't like that. So they're finally moving in the EV direction now. And their goal is to let 100% of their fleet be electric by 2040, which is, in my opinion, way too late. More than 15 years from now, they're going to be fully electric. This should be something that happens in the next five to 10 years. Anyways, in other news, Avnish Bajaj, the founder and managing partner of Matrix Partners India, has said that the future prospects of unicorns in India is looking a little bit bleak. 20 to 30% of the unicorns will struggle to find a business model and will have to go through a fire sale or return money to investors. A majority of 50 to 60% of unicorns with viable business models will need to take a flat round or a down round. He also said that I think 20 to 30% of quality companies, unicorns like a business and one card in our portfolio will see up rounds. However, up rounds won't be two to four X times the previous valuation or happen three times a year. They will be 30 to 50% above the previous valuation because though business has grown, multiples are low. All right, next up, the Enforcement Directorate has raided the offices of several gaming companies in India. And I use the word gaming in the Indian sense to talk about gambling startups and fantasy sports startups. You know, are they gaming? Are they gambling? Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody can decide. Whereas in the rest of the world, of course, gaming is playing games like GTA and Minecraft and PUBG, Valorant, those kinds of games, right? So I'm using it in the Indian context here, but it's actually a pretty wild story. So in total, 25 different locations were raided by the ED in places like Delhi, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, and Andhra Pradesh. And these companies were registered in countries like Krakow, Malta, and Cyprus, but were linked to bank accounts based in India and open in the name of proxy people. So these were just people who were underneath the actual directors of this whole operation. And we're talking hundreds of companies here that were collecting money from these gambling games and then sending that money outside of India. About 4,000 crore rupees total was sent out under the guise of payments for import of goods and services. And this was basically just one big shell game. And the last news that I have for you guys before we move on to the funding news is that Ola Electric is officially planning on going public before the general elections in 2024. And if we look at the timeline here for Ola Electric's products and when they're going to be launching, we can see that they're planning to launch a mass electric scooter and a premium motorcycle this year in 2023, then a mass motorcycle and a premium car in 2024, and then a premium SUV in 2025, followed by a mass market car sometime after that. So these are very exciting times for India's EV industry. And my only hope is that Ola Electric has learned from their lessons with the S1 and S1 Pro and going forward into the future they're not planning on shipping unfinished products like they did last time. Anyways, now let's move on to the funding news. $232 million have been raised across India's entire startup ecosystem this week. Here's what that looks like in context. So it's a bit of an up from last week. And a large chunk of this was raised by PhonePay, which I don't know if we can really call them a startup. I wouldn't. They're owned by Walmart. But next to PhonePay, we have Chalo. And these guys raised $45 million in their seed round, plus $12 million in debt as well. And this is a transportation startup, which is bringing GP tracking and mobile ticketing to India's bus travel sector. Awesome company, awesome idea. They're solving a genuine problem here. Next, we have NIC, and this is another cool one. They're a Pune-based ice cream company. They raised $11 million in their pre-series A round. And then the last company that I wanted to highlight here is Gone.ai, or Jan.ai, I'm not sure how they say it, but it's a really cool idea. They're using AI to mass produce personalized video messages. So take a look at this. Hi Swaroop. Hi Pravalika. Hi Rajanindani. Hi Ashraf. How are you doing? Now, 
Obviously, the pronunciation is a little bit off. This is still in the early stages, right? So it's not as smooth as I'm guessing they want it to be in the future. Here, I'll, I'll do my own little impersonation of this. Hi, Pooja. Hi, Avnish. Hi, Varun. Hi, Radhika. I'm so excited to send you this personalized message. But here's the thing. There are a lot of people in the comments who are thanking Cameron Green for sending his personal message. And I'm sure that most of them know, I'm sure all of them know that he didn't send it personally. It's an AI created thing, but they're still loving it. So the potential is definitely here and we can see how big of an impact this is going to have thanks to the reception of this one very early version of these personalized AI video messages. And the way that I see this working in the future is that cricketers and Bollywood celebrities will actually just be able to license out their identity to companies like GAN.AI and then they'll earn residual income from the fact that they've licensed that out. And there will be voice models trained on their voice specifically. Maybe they'll do some pre recorded video that can later on be manipulated. So their lips and their eyes are going to be moved to match the tone of the message that's being sent by GAN.AI. I don't think that just replacing the name is the long term vision. That's just what they've been able to do with the seed round that they've raised. $5.25 million is the amount here. But once they raise a series A, once they actually get a little bit bigger and they have more rev uh, more capital to work with, then I think the potential for this will actually become much bigger and the videos that they're sending out will be much more convincing as well. So I'm definitely excited to see where these guys go. Anyways, that is all the startup news that I have for you guys this week and I'll see you in the next one. Oh, and don't forget about the, the link in the description for the uh, feedback for this compliances, regulations, legalities, all that stuff. Okay, thanks so much.